This is KZSU Stanford. Welcome to Entitled Opinions. My name is Robert Harrison, and we're coming to you from the Stanford campus. I don't know who composes the maxims in Chinese fortune cookies, but most of them are as dry, saccharine, and indigestible as the cookies themselves. I once thought about marketing my own fortune cookies with aphorisms for the literate, the learned, and the lunatic, with occasional nods to the lustful, libido felicito in sua legge, Every now and then you do come across one that's inadvertently interesting, though. There's a Chinese restaurant I like on California Street in Palo Alto called the Jade Palace. And the other day, a fortune was served up to me after lunch, which read, As long as you give, you will have. Now, if that's true, it's good news for entitled opinions. For here we are, five years and counting, still giving. And it's reassuring to think that as long as we give, we will continue to have, rather than assume that we can give only as long as we have. Take care of the giving, and the having will take care of itself. Now, how's that for a cookie? Speaking about giving, we have a really fine gift for you today. I have with me in the studio one of America's most prominent literary authors, Tobias Wolf, whose appearance on this show is long overdue. Things just kept getting in the way for one reason or another. But here we are finally with Tobias Wolf, who, in addition to being a novelist, is also a great master of the short story. I've been thinking a lot about the short story in conjunction with this show, and I'm eager to hear Tobias's thoughts about the genre. But first, let me mention that as I was reading through Tobias's recently published collection of short stories titled Our Story Begins, I found myself, I don't know why, thinking over and over about Michelangelo, of all people. In particular, I kept thinking about what Michelangelo says about the art of sculpture in one of his most famous sonnets, where he writes... Non ha l'ottimo artista alcun concetto, con marmo solo in sé, non circonscriva col suo soverchio, e solo a quello arriva la man che ubbidisce all'intelletto. Translation The best artist has no conception that a block of marble still unworked does not already contain within its own excess. And that conception is brought out by the hand that obeys the intellect. Paraphrase. The art of sculpture is a process of extraction, of removing all that is superfluous in the stone, until the latent idea that hides within the block is revealed in its radiant, perfected form. When I read a good short story, or let me say when I read a story by... Tobias Wolf, I have the impression that the block of marble is a potential novel that the author attacks with his pen, removing all that would be superfluous in that novel until he arrives at the quintessential conception at the heart of the matter, 
which now comes forth as a decisively sculpted, highly condensed work of art. That is another way of saying that there is nothing more that the author either could add or remove without compromising the story's perfect distillation of its essential narrative content. Of course, when you have this degree of distillation in the work of art, it calls for an equal degree of concentration or attention to detail on behalf of the person who sets out to read it. For it is not only the author who gives the story to the reader, it's the reader who gives the story its meaning. For where would that meaning take place if there were no readers to make sense of the words in which it is contained? To express it otherwise, as long as you give, you will have, is a principle that applies to the reader's generosity toward literature, which continues to give as long as there are readers who give it their receptive attention. Great short stories require a shorter yet more intense measure of concentration than novels, to be sure. That is why some people prefer short stories to novels, but why more people prefer novels to short stories. In both cases, a mutual generosity is called for, yet with novels, the giving is more relaxed, more aerobic, as it were, while with short stories, the giving is more punctual or anaerobic. Speaking for myself, I tend to prefer novels to short stories for the same reason that I tend to prefer television series to movies, but that's a whole other story and not a short one at that. We're going to talk today with Tobias Wolff about the novel and the short story and about his own contribution to both genres, so without taking up any more of our airtime, let, wel- let me welcome him to the program. Tobias, has taken a while, but it's a real pleasure to finally have you join us here on Entitled Opinions. And I'm glad to be here, Robert. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, we're going to have your bio, uh, extensive bio, posted on our webpage so that readers can consult that. And um, here, you know, I can, I have already mentioned that you've authored novels as well as short stories, but that um, short stories, if I'm not mistaken, is a genre that I would, I'm tempted to conclude you actually uh, favor over the novel. Uh, but if I'm mistaken about that, you know, I, I, I will stand corrected. Gladly. Well, I tend to favor whatever it is that I'm working on at that moment. Okay. Uh, and before we talk about uh, the, your short stories and novels, uh, as you know, J.D. Salinger has died recently in the last week. Um, and there were a number of editorials and comments about his importance uh, in the American uh, on the American literary scene, his reclusiveness and so forth. Uh, just for the record, is Salinger someone that you were um, that has a, had an influence on you in any way? Oh yes, no question about it. Uh, I remember uh, when I was 15 years old, I was a scholarship student at a boarding school, uh, just a few miles actually from the one he went to, Valley Forge Military Academy, where it was said Catcher in the Rye was banned, which meant, of course, that everyone there must have read it. But um, a friend of mine gave me Catcher in the Rye, and I I remember the night vividly. Uh, I was in a play, and it was one of our, you know, we would have two or three night run, and it was uh, uh, probably the second night. I remember it wasn't opening night, and and I picked this up because I wasn't on a lot. I picked this up and this novel up and started reading it, and I was just pulled in by that voice, you know, that famous first sentence. And and, uh, I felt such a kinship with this this character and and his, his, his language, his vision of the place that he was in, which in some ways resembled the place I was in, some very... Very, very, in very profound ways, actually, uh, and it was just so funny. I remember just, uh, you know, being carried away by this to the point that I twice missed uh, uh, my cue to appear on stage. That is what one of the reasons I remembered this so vividly. Um, and I've read the novel again and again over the years. All of my children have read it. Uh, 
in their school curriculum at different times, uh, all three of my kids, and I've read it each time they were doing it. And and like important work, it does change under your eyes as you get older. And what seemed so funny to me when I was 15 often seems achingly sad to me now. Uh, I was very willing to participate in his view of the adult world as a conspiracy of phonies uh, when I was 15 because it let me off the hook for a lot of things that I uh, uh, was responsible for. And, And now I see the sadness of his need to see the world that way, of Holden's need to see the world that way. Uh, it's a beautiful novel. It really is. Uh, and I don't think it's lost anything. Uh, and it's wonderful that we can change uh, our vision of uh, of a work as we get older, as we grow into it. Um, and, I, and then I went on and read everything, really, that I could get my hands on of his. Uh, the stories have particularly stayed with me. Uh, those stories were written, you know, 55 to 60 years ago. And we still talk about them. They are absolutely extraordinary stories. Uh, of course, everyone knows A Perfect Day for Banana Fish, the, the story set in Florida when Seymour uh, uh, kills himself, Seymour Glass. But, uh, but, but uh, stories like The Laughing Man, narrated by a boy in summer camp who watches a love affair come apart under his eyes and it breaks his own heart. Um, Uncle Wiggly in Connecticut. Uh, Dresme with Love and Squalor, uh, De Namorier Smith's Blue Period. These are just wonderful, vivid, luminous stories. Pretty Mouth and Green My Eyes, that heartbreaking story about a man discovering his his wife's adultery with the man that he turns to for, for comfort and counsel. Uh, and uh you know they're really they're really unforgettable stories and and uh, Robert Frost once said that uh if a poet can get a few poems stuck in places where it's really hard to get them out uh, he's had a he's had a good life as a poet yeah. and and Salinger certainly uh you know is on our shelf uh, uh I, I think for good for good yeah a lot of critics literary critics thought that um nine stories was an, a more important major literary achievement than Catcher in the Rye. And I was reading in the New York Times, um, you know, in the one of the articles, that um, where the writer remarks that these stories were remarkable for their sharp social observation, their pitch-perfect dialogue. Mr. Salinger, who used italics almost as a form of musical notation, was a master not of literary speech, but of speech as people actually spoke it, and the way they demolished whatever was left of the traditional architecture of the short story, the old structure of beginning, middle, end, for an architecture of emotion in which a story could turn on a tiny alteration of mood or irony. Uh, I would say that that is wrong in almost every point. Um, to begin with, let's 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 take this question of the architecture of the story. Uh, it is true that uh, there is a tradition of a, of a certain kind of story, say the kind of story that Tolstoy wrote, that has a, a, say the death of Ivan Illich, in which he is introduced as a young man. We take him through his life. He reaches a crisis, and then through that crisis, bec- reaches a certain understanding of himself, and the novel ends with a great kind of sense of finality with his death, but also a kind of realization of his life at the the time of his death that we would normally associate with a novel, I think, that that, uh, very complete structure with everything known at the end. Um, And that has certainly been a vigorous and worthy strain in the writing of the short story um, all the way through. But there's another... uh, uh, there's another art uh, that uh, parallels that and is rather different, and that is the art, say, of uh, Turgenev or Chekhov, particularly Chekhov, I would say, who does all those things that the writer attributes to Salinger. He uh, he eliminates uh, – often, for example, uh, you'll have a story that will simply begin with three men walking into a fog. There you are. No explanation. 
it only emerges through their conversation and through the thoughts of one man that he is being taken by the other two to, si- to exile in Siberia. And he's dreaming. It's called dreams, in fact. He's dreaming about how great Siberia is going to be. With, and he has images of fishing and hunting. And, and you realize, as the story goes on, without ever being told this, that he is not going to make it, in fact. He's ill. Uh, it's a tragic story and made all the more poignant by his own inability to recognize the tragic dimension of the situation that he is in, is his, his inability to even see that he's dying. Uh, you see, and, um, and, and that moment when you realize that, that's one of those moments without ever reaching – they're still marching into the fog at the end. He has not died. He has realized nothing. We have realized something, and that's a very different kind of story. And that's the tradition that Salinger draws on. He will begin, for example, in Uncle Wiggly in Connecticut, these two drunken uh, friends out in the suburbs um, talking about, you know, their marriages and their their lives. And, uh, and you realize they're so nostalgic for the time of innocence when they were young and for <clears> – <throat> For the innocence, as they remember it, of their of their romantic relationships when they were young, and the sense of compromise and entrapment that they feel now, um, and uh, and that is exactly the sort of uh, tradition that 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 we, we you know that we see exemplified in someone like Chekhov or or Turgenev. Um, and in, would F. Scott Fitzgerald have been a predecessor in that regard, in your view? No, I think his stories tend to be a little more in the, in the Tolstoyan mode. Uh, he he will start a little more in medias re. He will start kind of in the beginning of a story without a lot of uh, explanatory material. But if you look at a story like Winter Dreams or uh, Babylon Revisited, uh, some of the great uh, Diamond as Big as the Ritz, they're full of uh, – they really are generally full of, or the rich boy. They, they're well led up to – they're well explained in the middle, and they generally reach um, they, they generally generally reach a kind of uh, um, understandable conclusion right. with, and I mean it can be tragic as in the case of Babylon revisited um, but uh, they feel to me almost like small novels the way Tolstoy uh, the way Tolstoy stories do. So they're, I think, in a different uh, uh, register. I would use, say, Hemingway, however, is very much in the, I, I mean, I, how can you speak of, of, of the kind of story that Salinger's writing without speaking of the kind of story that Hemingway wrote? He learned a great deal from him. It's an art of implication. Hemingway talks famously about a story should be like an iceberg with nine tenths of you know move. What does he say? Move with the dignity of an iceberg with nine tenths of it underwater, and <clears throat> and that's what we feel in in Salinger that there's an implied story uh, beyond what we're seeing there. We feel the pressure of that implied story all the time in it, and it's a it's a very very difficult kind of art I think to achieve. And Salinger was a master of it. There's no question about it, and he had a lot of heart. And, a, and, and he had a good sense of humor. He's funny. And he was obsessed. I, I think to some extent all great writers are obsessed. He was obsessed with the problem of innocence and the, and the entrance, the, the painful entrance into adulthood and uh, maybe even sentimentally so. Um, but the other thing I would say is about his ear. This is nothing new, of course. Um, you know, even Fal- I mean, Faulkner has a wonderful ear for the way people speak. Obviously, Huckleberry Finn sets the pattern for that as a kind of counter Hawthorne, say. Um, but the truth is, and this is to his credit, uh, Salinger's speech is actually highly stylized. It isn't simply transcribed. Um, he created a sound of human speech of a certain class of person that really wasn't quite there before. And the tone rings true. But but he's not actually just repeating what people say. Yeah, he says, for Christ's sake, a lot, and that sort of thing. There are certain signature mo- movements in his in his dialogue. But but it's a very stylized dialogue, actually. Yeah. Well, this raises a, a number of issues that I would like to correlate with your own um, aesthetic, if I can use that term. Uh, and I guess I would like to... S- 
maybe begin with the thematic rather than the stylistic, unless you prefer to go the other way I around. Because I, whichever you like. Uh, well, let's let's start with, then with the stylistic because the what you quoted there from Hemingway about the the iceberg and this sort of um, the short story, which is largely there's all this pressure uh, of implication. And a lot that remains latent that doesn't come out fully. I find that this is uh, often the case in my reading of many of your, um, certain your short stories, mm -hmm. that there's a, a lot more that is not actually coming out in, into the open, than, than, but is at the same time present. Is this something that, uh, that um, on the one hand, do you agree with it? And do you see yourself, therefore, in a genealogy with uh, some of these writers we've been mentioning? Well, I have tried very hard not to be uh, captive to any particular uh, uh, vision of the short story, but to use whatever forms are available to me to tell the story that I want to tell at that time. I have stories that I, I suppose follow a, 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 uh, a more fully explained model than, than that of the kind of Hemingway definition, stories like, uh, I don't know, uh, The Rich Brother, which begins with the line, there were two brothers, you know, the same line that begins the story of Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves, or that could begin the story of Abel and Cain. Uh, and, and what you see played out in that story um, has a context and in, in a way that some of my other stories don't, because I really wanted to get the whole sweep of their life together. Uh, another story, Deep Kiss, is much more fully explained and, and less implicit than some of my other stories. So I will, some of them feel like mock memoirs, or, or they, they have the, uh, not mock memoirs, but they f have the character of memoir, even though they're fictions. Uh, and, and so I've, I've drawn on that. Uh, genre of writing in, 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 in my short stories as well. So I, um, uh, I do think it's, it's necessary to be able to do all kinds of, 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 of storytelling because not every story should be told in the same way. I, I agree with that. And so, for example, you mentioned Deep Kiss, which is um, uh, the last story in this collection, Our Story Begins, I believe. And That's right. It... Um, while it does seem to be explicit in terms of context and reconstruction of, of narrative events and so forth, there's still, for me, at least at the thematic level, something very enigmatic, mysterious, and elusive about what is this story really trying to get at. And you, you as the author, are not providing uh, anything. You're not throwing anything in, into my lap as a reader. It's something that has to be probed and where you are in uncharted territory about how a life took this shape and yeah. why this character who is looking back on it was what this kiss actually uh, uh, that, that he has such a vivid recollection in his much later years and, and how that works to give a narrative uh, sort of architecture to how he perceives his life and yet it has absolutely nothing to do with the concrete let's say uh, pragmatic um, events that are also described you, uh, you mm -hmm. describe those the, the uh, the events, his marriage and his jobs and so forth. But then there's this other thing going on at another level, and the reader is left to his or her own devices in order to try to find out what the correlation is between well, the psychic the, truth and, and the, the, let's say, the, the, the narrative truth. You know? Well, left to your own devices only in so far as that I trust you to be able to read the story and to, and to feel... Uh, those elements of the story that might suggest a reason for sure. for his uh, uh, f formation for the way he uh, he sees the past, the things that were important to him in the past, the way, things that led him off off uh, off the conventional path when he was young. He became so obsessed with the girl that he actually had to be shipped away from his home. Uh, he was in the common parlance now stalking her, in fact. And, and, uh, and why is that? And you have to ask. And it obviously had, a, had an effect on his life and, and his capacity to form emotional attachments later. Uh, and what is going on when he forms this attachment with this girl? Well, his father is dying. And he's in, they've been very close. It comes out in little ways, yes. but he's... Uh, 
He's obviously terrified and even feels in some strange way betrayed by his father's dying. And uh, and I think the, the life of the senses has somehow taken over for him as a, as a place to be at, 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 at a moment when he is not able to face what, what, what is actual in his life and what is demanding things from him. And, uh, and so we see that, that, that pattern somewhat played out in his life, I think, uh, and a little below the level of his awareness. It does come to him, though, in ways that are painful. But I do think that, you know, I never say that in the story, no. but those elements are all there. And, uh, and that is, for me, the crux of the relationship between the short story writer and the reader. It is an... It, I, my stories, I like my stories to the degree that I have felt that I have trusted my reader, uh, that, the, that, the, that the reader is able to apprehend, uh, perhaps even at an intuitive level, those things which I'm hoping the reader will understand without being told. I resent being told things when I read that I could have understood or, fe- or even better perhaps felt on the back of my neck as I read it. Uh, it 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 bleeds the pleasure out of the out of the enterprise for me, and so my my relationship with the reader is one uh, of you know I uh, I trust I want to trust the reader to be as good a reader as I think I am, and and I know that sometimes um, readers will be disappointed by a lack of uh, of what they perceive to be um, direction that I'm not really helping them enough to understand. And uh, and that may be true, but I would rather err on that side than on the other. Well, you know, enough direction to understand is an expectation I don't uh, demand of, of the author. But I do get intrigued, for example, about the, the rumor that um, the girl, Mary Claude is her name, I don't remember. Mary Claude, is that her mm-hmm. name? Mm-hmm. The one that he was had a fixation on mm-hmm. in, in his youth, and which obviously was a fixation that never left him. Mm-hmm. But that uh, she's uh, she dies, he learns about her death many years, decades later, and there's this kind of rumor that she might have died uh, because she had a lover with whom every time they crossed each other on the road, they would uh, swerve. I mean, one they would change the, lanes. They would change lanes, and that there was someone who was she thought was a lover, it, same car, but not the lover, and that she might have crashed. And, and so I, at the end of, the, of a story like that, I ponder, I, I wonder uh, how much I can do with this figure of, uh, well, what, a kind what? of accidental. Uh, it's an accident in, in many senses of the term accident no mm-hmm. yeah things coming together and and playing out a but it's a the chain fulfillment of i think of what we've seen in her earlier and why things went went bad between them is that she's an all or nothing person and she demands that of him she uh she wants his attention she wants his commitment at every moment and the one time when he shrugs her off, is the end for her. That's it, all or nothing. And you can see her, again, it's a rumor, though. We're not sure this actually happened. She did die in a head-on collision. Uh, but, uh, and it may be, in fact, likely that this is what, yeah. this is what happened. Uh, but, but the truth is that we don't absolutely know this is, this is what happened. We're seeing this through the, through the eyes of, 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 of our... Uh, you know our our protagonist, but um, but I think that's a, a kind of flowering of the character that we have seen in her earlier. I agree. Can I ask you about a few other stylistic features that strike me? And again, I please correct me if you, if I if I've misperceived. But I uh, what I find very refreshing when I read you is this complete absence of what I call a writerly style, and by I mean that in the negative sense of where. So many American authors, and I have to confess here that the reason I, I have a, a certain kind of uh, neurotic reaction to many prose writers, uh, literary writers in, in America, is that they're always posturing as, at writing. And from the first page on, they're, they're contrived metaphors engaged in you know these little gimmicks that are, are like uh, word painting and things. There's none of that in your prose. Uh, and to the degree that I think that you even mm, uh, 
don't feel comfortable using metaphors. The first thing people are taught in creative writing classes in in America is how to find you know unusual or you know lively animate me- metaphors. Is it not in my class? Not in your classes. Okay. <laughs> not in, is there I, a conspicuous absence of I, metaphor in your writing style? Well, first of all, I don't think one can generalize about about what is taught in creative writing classes. In fact, I would imagine that in a in a class taught by a good writer, uh, students would be uh, cautioned about doing exactly what you're talking about, doing this preposterous search for the metaphor. Uh, I do sometimes use them. Sometimes it's inescapable that uh, that that you that you want to, as you know, as George Herbert or John Donne will, you want to liken something to someone else to make that the strange familiar, or the familiar strange for a moment. There's a there's a wonderful uh, kind of uh, arsenal of uses for for simile and metaphor. Generally speaking, they feel in in the prose of, of of many writers somewhat reflexive and mandatory and by the book and and they slow things down. They don't. They actually obscure rather than uh, sharpen your view of of the proceedings. And I I'm I'm interested in in the exact statement of the situation yeah. as near as as I can reach it. And often that means that I would have to eschew. The use of, of of metaphor. Also, it, I mean, I, I just got something from a friend the other day. I hope you don't mind, but he uh, he always keeps me up to date on the uh, the dark and stormy night contest. Yeah. I don't know if you're aware of this, but not, not the contest. Uh, well, it's it's a contest that's held every year for basically the worst writing. Now, I I've I've always felt a little sorry for Bulwer Lytton, who wrote that. It was a dark and stormy night. You know, uh, Charles Schultz used to use it in, for Snoopy and. I think, what's wrong with that line, actually? <laughs> Sometimes it's a dark and stormy night. Anyway, here are some of the metaphors that came through in the most recent. Uh, and and I have a point in bringing this okay. up, right, other than jokes. He was as tall as a six-foot-three tree. <laughs> Here's one I really love. John and Mary had never met. They were like two hummingbirds who had also never met. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. In fact, the, the the point of something like that is, or this one more, just one more. And I'll stop. I promise. The young, because uh, there are literally about a hundred of them. The young fighter had a hungry look, the kind you get from not eating for a while. <laughs> but these are parodies, I presume. Well, these are parodies, of course, but they're hitting something here, which is, which is often simply the unnecessariness right. of. I mean, you're simply saying. Again, something you've already said, but but in doing it, you're you're taking the reader even farther away. For I think that's what I was trying to also allude to in my opening remarks about extraction or distillation, and and not say something uh, in a redundant manner. And so many of these metaphors are redundant, as you say. Yeah. Yeah. I, having said that, though, I mean, I've I've written a novel called Old School, which uh, in which the narrator does have a more writerly, a more full voice. He is a writer, in fact, the character. And uh, I don't think he's, you know, tiresome, but but that would have to I would I had to give him a different voice than I tend to use in my short stories. And similarly, the novel I'm working on now is is actually even a little purplish here and there. It's very full throated. Um, and there's a reason for that. And and uh, I know you and I have talked and you're not a great fan of Faulkner. Am I right? Well, I. Put it this way: I, I, I'm a fan. I mean, I admire him because of, of uh, what he's achieved. But he's not someone I read with with the, the pleasure that I read um, many other great writers with. I don't know uh-huh. why he, he, he. There's something about him that makes me unsettles me and makes me very nervous. Uh-huh. And, and I so when the pleasure principle is subtracted, I can admire, but uh, not warm up to. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Uh, well, he's a writer, and, and I think Hemingway is a writer in this category. I mean, really, any very distinctive writer, Carver would be, certainly I would mention him. Uh, unlike, say, Alice Munro, uh, these are writers who, in a sense, teach you how to read them as you read them. And <clears throat> and then you can begin to submit to them. And, 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 uh, and I really love Faulkner. I didn't at first. Um, and... And it isn't that 
that his work is a net, I, I, I think his work, like Nabokov's, who can also be very, I think, uh, uh, I mean, you know, look at the beginning of the famous beginning of Lolita. It's filled with metaphor and, and simile. It's, it's almost overripe in some ways. As, uh, uh, but it's very related to the character of Humbert Humbert. He uses language as a dodge in a way. Um, and I would, th- there's something irreducible to me about Nabokov's language, as full as it is, and I find that to be true of Faulkner too. It's just a different kind of song, and I really, I really do love it. I couldn't ever write like that in a million years, uh, and and woe be unto those who try. I mean, very few. I think Cormac McCarthy does a pretty good job of following in his footsteps, but not too many others do. Um, simply because it isn't nat- their natural idiom, really. Somehow or other, it was his. Um, but I, I, uh, I mean, I certainly know what you mean there. But there are users of metaphor who are, I, I agree with you, that there's nothing superfluous about them. And yeah. Joseph Conrad is another one who comes to oh, mind. Oh, absolutely. Where there's a relentless effort to describe things in, in a kind of honest spirit. He's, he wrote in the preface to The Nigger of the Narcissus, that the work of art must justify itself line by line, and you have a sense of an honest effort to evoke a, a visual description or a psychological description through a relentless use of metaphor. Absolutely. So, and I, I mean, I, speaking of the heart of darkness, you know, yeah. that, that scene when I love, first of all, just the complicated narrative structure of that because it's not actually narrated by Marlowe. It's narrated by someone who's hearing Marlowe tell the story. But Marlowe's sitting on this boat in the Thames with his friend and he's talking about how even this country, even this land that they're sitting in, and he suddenly calls up the image of a young Roman who's gotten into gambling debts and been sent out to the provinces and and to be lost in this wilderness of Britannia, uh, you know, with the, with the forest and the animals and that great phrase, the hearts of wild men. And suddenly you're a thousand miles, a thousand years away from from uh, from that place where you're sitting, and it's richly metaphorical, both in in its narrative sense and also in its language. And I and I wouldn't I wouldn't give up a word of it, you know. Yeah, no, no, that that is a, a perfect short story in, in, in oh, my book. Absolutely. Yeah. On the thematic level, Tobias, the uh, you talked about Salinger and, and this uh, pathos of the the painful entrance into adulthood and this persistent nostalgia for the innocence of youth. And I want to ask you about uh, youth in your own corpus, because you mentioned um, the novel you wrote, The Old School, which is uh, a a really beautiful account of of, um, grade school, a literary education uh, in at a certain stage in, in one's life. Portrait of the artist as a young man. If yeah. you want to, if you want to use a, that metaphor, it, it, uh, there's also the uh, the book which really um, made you the, the American master, an American master, and that's the this boy's life. The short stories that we've been talking about, many of them are not set in youth, but many of them involve uh, intense recollections, where youth is always this point of reference uh, from which uh, all other forms of orientation. Uh, take their um, take their center, and it 's unlike salinger you don 't you don 't i mean if anyone who 's read this boy 's life is not going to accuse you of, of romanticizing or idealizing the innocence of youth there 's a lot of dark and uh, painful experiences that are uh, confronted frontally and uh, and you got through t- on the other side however youth continues to be a strong point of reference for for your work in in many respects is that correct i I would say that's probably true um not all i mean i don't obviously refer to to you know youth is not a an element in every one of my of, of my stories or works but it certainly does seem to be a pulse in my work and uh i suppose part of that is that writers are interested in uh, those moments of uh, of change, those 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 those, even if it is as the elegist for uh, Salinger said, uh, you know, just a uh, a turn of phrase in which a a, a life can ch- can change. But 
but yeah, the young are still in formation. They're interesting that way. Uh, by the time you reach the age of 40 or 50, you're probably pretty well fixed as, as in, in your character. And, 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 uh, but you're not. You're still trying things on when you're young, trying on different roles. Uh, and you are not really innocent. Um, you, I mean, I, one, one of the things that I am, you know, I, I would certainly make a distinction between, say, my view of things and Salinger's view of things is that I do not view youth as an innocent age at all. Um, it's not any more corrupt, I think, than adulthood, but you're really trying out everything at that point and also things that, you know, um, that, 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 that sometimes harm others, that are, that are difficult to others and, and, and insensitive and selfish. In fact, I think a lot of growing up, to speak outside of the discussion of the story now, has to do with becoming less selfish. Uh, I think there's a, 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 we are, you know, when we're born, everybody's leaning over our cribs, adoring us, bringing, we cry, somebody brings us something. We are trained from the cradle to be selfish and to assume that our will should carry matters in the world. And and growing up is is the process of shedding that painfully by, by painful stage by painful stage and and to becoming aware of the reality of other people in the world and all that sort of thing and and I try to make that that sense that I have of of, of what it means to grow up part of my work and uh, so yes uh, yes young people definitely will uh, will are playing and will play a, a, a part in my work there's a, a motif that recurs not a Everywhere, obviously, but um, of, of disappointment, of gr growing into adulthood and getting not to the end of the road, but kind of close enough there that you're looking back and, and the unfulfilled life, the unfulfilled promise. I don't know if it is correlated exactly with the the, the, the promises that you have. That youth represents open horizons of possibilities, and then later on you realize that these possibilities have been narrowed down to just a, you know, a, a sliver of what they were originally uh, uh, promised when one is young. But many of the characters in your stories do... That sounds more like Salinger than me. I, yeah. I, there, there is the character in Deep Kiss, I Deep think Kiss. you may be thinking of, who, who does have a sense almost of having lived a parallel life. He has been... He's I'm thinking never... also of Nightingale, the father in Nightingale. I don't know if you would call that uh, an experience of disappointment as, uh, as such, but no, I don't think it is so much. It's a, it's a, it's it, there. It's a, it's a sense that that story is about losing your children in a way, and that uh, it's an al almost an allegory of the finality of separation from your children, and and how you both are wanting to push them out into the world onto the not very tender mercies of the world and at that moment when they're gone you suddenly realize that they are they're you know they're gone uh but in that case it's not a nostalgia for it's not an in fact when he looks back on his youth he suddenly realizes he's been falsifying it in fact sure. uh to himself and as well as to his son and using himself as a kind of exemplary figure that his son should imitate when he actually honestly looks back on what it was that he was like and what was driving him then he the, he realizes that that he created a you know a non-existent person he created a fiction that he had gone through all these hard times and that he was toughened by life and that um, he, he's worried about his son's vulnerability and the unproven uh, nature of, of, of the son's life and wants to toughen him up. And he, so he willfully expels him from yeah. the garden of the home exactly. uh, in, into a kind of military academy. And then on his way back, he realizes that if I'm now, after it's too late perhaps, I, if I'm going to be honest with myself, was I really so tough? What, didn't I have my own um, vulnerabilities at his age? Right. Do I, did I really have to go to these extreme measures in order to protect my son against future, right. you know, hypothetical uh, uh, heartbreaks or whatever? That's right. Yeah, when he gets to the place, he decides to get his son back because the place has obviously had a very brutal, yeah. there's a clear brutal ethos that he could feel in the place, a place of judgment. And and, and that and, story is full of um, maps. Well, it, it, it's about 
having very poor maps of how to yeah. get to the place yeah. and also how to get out of that place. Yeah. And this idea that uh, the map can also serve to understand how you, how you navigate your way through a life and do you exactly. really know where you're going or where you have come from and can you really find your way back and uh, there, there is a, you know, the past can become a fiction in, in, in later life. Exactly. It does. Uh, and let me say, Robert, uh, that you're warming my heart because you're exactly the reader that I am at, that I hope reads my work that, you know, I mean, I don't expect everybody to get this business with the maps, but I love that you did. See, I trust right. you and you did it. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yes, absolutely. And, you know, Frost was really on to this in that very much misunderstood poem of his, The Road Not Taken, when he, you know, it's commonly understood to be a kind of hymn to to the individual spirit and the, taking the difficult path over the easy one. Uh, but if you actually look at the poem, he says, but as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. Uh, and uh, and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black okay but at the last at the end he says i shall be telling this with a sigh some day ages and ages hence how two roads met in a wood and i i took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference well, what is that about? I mean, all that melodramatic with a sigh, and I, I took the one less traveled by. He's making fun of the way we glamorize our choices as we get older. And, and, and probably, I mean, he sees ahead. He said, I know that the, ver- that the different ways that I have taken, I'm going to fictionalize them later. And I'm going to make it sound that whatever went well, I did because it was the right thing or the hard thing to do. It's a wonderful story about the way we turn the past on its head as we get older for our own purposes. And and certainly the doctor and Nightingale has done that, and and we all do it to some extent, mostly, I think, unconscious. That, uh, I, I, I don't believe that Frost thinks his that he's going to be, or his narrator is going to be doing this as a conscious act of deception, but as something intrinsic to the way we remember. Yeah. Well, this brings up another issue, uh, going back to this boy's life, about uh, youth as uh, a series of confronting of adversities and real pain, and in that case, you know, even abusive stepfather and and that... uh, leads to a certain resiliency in the the young, young man or in later life. And in a certain sense, the father in Nightingale is trying to give his son uh, a, whatever it would take to have that kind of resiliency. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here to do kind of generational thing of lamenting that young people, but it is the case that uh, we live in a society right now where there's such an overprotection of the young and such a um, uh, anxiety about exposing them to um, uh, anything that has to do with abuse or conflict and all this sort of ego shoring up and, and, uh, you know, the self-esteem programs and so forth that one wonders what, how much do we really owe to the pain that uh, even though we might glamorize it later in life and fictionalize it in a way that it doesn't represent, but all that pain might, um, might be part of a, um, a necessary formation. Well, if we're if we're sparing our children what pain we can when they're young, uh, it's making a mistake of the right kind. I think uh, I don't know what the alternative would be. Uh, no, certainly not what the father does in Nightingale, which well, is to go I'd, send him into into a military well, brutal. At the same military. time, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I I don't know what I really don't know what to what to think about that. I uh, I remember reading an article not long ago in which the writer talks about how litigious we've become and how when he was a boy, growing up in Massachusetts, he and his friends would go skating on the pond and they didn't have to deal with signs saying you couldn't do this and and that if somebody fell in, that was. They fell in, and their parents weren't going to sue the municipality about it. And how every little league game now was kind of became a, a, a an occasion of parental concern. And 
Certainly, I actually, <clears throat> when I lived in Syracuse, I was a little league coach, and I, 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 I saw uh, a change in the way parents behaved that that was uh, really an awakening to me. I mean the. Uh, uh, the yelling at, at an umpire who calls a strike on his kid and the yelling at the kid constantly, that would never have happened when I, I played Little League as a kid and Babe Ruth League. and I mean, that just wouldn't have happened. And so there is, yeah, there is that sense of a, of a cocooning going on. I don't know what the I don't know what the cure for well, that is. There's going to be pl- you know there's going to be a lot of pain and disappointment in anybody's life. Regardless, no one can yeah, yeah no one yeah. can protect them from that. And I don't know how you inoculate your kid against that by exposing. I, I don't know how by what process you would you would introduce that experience uh, in into someone's life. Well, yeah, that sociology is not part of our thing about <laughs> literature. Uh, you mentioned Robert Frost, quoting Robert Frost. Robert Frost has an important uh, appearance in um, the old school book. Mm-hmm. And can I ask in general, not only about Robert Frost, but what role do, does poetry play in your life as a, as a prose writer? Or uh, is, is poetry a, a deep love of yours? Yes, it is. Uh, and... Uh, for some reason or other, I, 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 when I was young, I, I found a pleasure in memorizing poetry and uh, carrying it around with me and having that, that portable pleasure, if you will, of poetry. I could memorize it more easily than I could prose. Uh, though I was, and my daughter is, is, loves to memorize things, and, and I'd get a gig, big kick out of when we were driving somewhere. I'd say, okay, give me the beginning of A Tale of Two Cities, and she can do the, you know, the whole thing. She just does this on her own. Uh, and, uh, and that was a pleasure that I had when I was young, and, and um, you know, perhaps it had something to do with the kind of poetry I was reading, too. It maybe Frost, for example, lends himself to memorization a little more easily than, than some other poets do. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, I. I uh, Who are some of the, your favorites in the English? T. S. Eliot. I know you. I know yeah, you. Yeah, I love, love the four quartets yeah. especially. But you know the uh, uh, the the uh, the wasteland is just wonderful things in it, and and uh, you know some of the early poems. My God, when I think of those, why sometimes the worlds revolve like ancient women gathering fuel in vacant lots. You know, or the Hollow Men. You know, uh, uh, the, oh, that beautiful love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And so, yeah, I had you know, uh, I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing for me. They're, ch- I don't know. They're, they take up a home in you, some poems. And uh, certainly, Frost was was that for me. George Herbert, uh, metaphysical poet. Uh, um, 17th century poet and someone who's really stayed with me. I love John Donne, um, and uh, and I love Keats. Um, How about some of the Americans, like Hart Crane? Hart Crane, I don't know that well. Yeah. I mean, I've read him. Uh, he isn't that close to my heart. Of the American poets, uh, well, Frost is, is, is... Frost is the number one for you? Uh, fr- I love Frost, and I, when I was younger, I really loved E.E. E. Cummings. I had a lot of his poems, even some of his early, less adventurous poems, uh, sonnets like it is in moments after I have dreamed. Uh, and uh, I love Robert Lowell's poetry. Uh, and oh gosh, uh, I like Sharon Olds a lot. Uh, and uh, C.K. Williams is a poet I really like a lot. I tend not any longer, perhaps because of my memory, to memorize the poets, but I read them. And, and I really like Robert Bly a lot, and I love his translations mm-hmm. uh, from uh, you know Rumi and Kabir, especially, uh, but and Thomas Tromer. Um, so that yeah, the the, the poetry uh, of this country is uh, um, just I think extraordinary and still is. It's vital. I agree. Finally, Tobias, you said you're, you're working on a book now. Could, would you mind sharing uh, with our listeners what what it is that you have in the works? Uh, it's hard for me to talk about a word a work in progress because it's always shifting under my under my hands. But right, I I had been working for about a year and a half on a book that uh, 
that I it never, I, it didn't feel quite alive to me. And yet I had said I was going to write this book and I was going to write this book. And it had to do with 70s radicals and hiding, actually. The, I got very interested in, I was teaching in San Francisco when, uh, at a high school during the time of the Patty Hearst kidnapping and the whole business with the Symbionese Liberation Army. And I got really interested in it then. And I've been following the fate of some of its members and especially this uh, uh, Kathleen Ann Celaya, who got caught in after 30 years. and Yeah, not too long. Yeah, ago. and she served some time in Chow Chill, and I think she's out now. Um, and I, I thought, what is it like to live for 30 years in incognito and eventually knowing as – I think I do how you become other people as you I mean she probably doesn't even think she is I mean she kept insisting she was innocent even when it was clear that she wasn't and she probably actually felt she was because that was somebody else damn it well, and sure. that's and, the past as a fiction yes exactly and uh, so I set out to write this and it just never really came to life and I finally bagged it and for the last uh, uh, several months I've been working on another book whose shape is much less clear to me, but the voice is alive. And I really, and I, well, that's what you want. That's what you want, for that's sure. That's what you want. Yeah. So uh, it will take me where it will at this point. I mean, I obviously have some idea where it's taking me, but that I, I, I keep a very loose hand on the la- reins when I write. It's you know, to get with this is a nice place to come back to that Michelangelo poem. It's discovering. It is not imposing a form. Yeah. It is discovering the form that, that is latent in, in this case, in, in, in the very character of the person who's speaking the story. Well, how about when you're done with it and it's out, we'll get you back on to Entitled Opinions to talk about it. I'd love that. All right. Thanks Thank you, for Bob. joining us. We've been speaking with Tobias Wolf, who uh, is a professor here at Stanford. And uh, this has been Robert Harrison for Entitled Opinions. We'll be with you again next week. Thanks again, Tobias. Thank you.